This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 516, recorded on October 19th, 2018. I'm Vincent Dracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. Where it has turned to winter. All of a sudden. Quite last last night it was five, four degrees Celsius. I know. I have this thing in my car that bings when it's freezing, you know, and it binged <laughs> last night. I have something inside my leg. That isn't, it, <laughs> isn't it kind of early for that? Early? Well, no, no. But we were not led into it in a gradual way. The week before that, it was in the 80s and humid. You know, nature is not kind. You know that. that it's cruel. It's a cruel thing. It is a cruel thing. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Here it's 53 degrees Fahrenheit, 12 yeah. degrees Celsius, partly cloudy, partly sunny. And, you know, in the spring people get annoyed because it reverts back to winter and then it's spring-like and summer-like and same thing in the fall. You know, we're going to have some warm weather again and it's going to be cold again. I just, uh, these two seasons have a lot of fluctu- fluctuation. Yeah, they do. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We got 64 degrees raining on, on and off. <laughs> That's 18, uh, 18 Celsius and we have Flooding, what we yeah, got, because rain, raining for two weeks and it's overwhelmed the uh, uh, flood control on the lower Colorado River. But um, uh, it's uh, reasonably well contained. I feel badly for the people who are getting trashed, but uh, it's reasonably well contained. You don't have anybody out there building an arc by any chance, do you? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> okay, not yet. Just worried. Most of the flooding is uh, quite a distance from here, Austin F- itself. I, I saw a funny Gary Larson joke regarding that, by the way. These uh, oh, two by two animals are getting on the ark, right? And these two uh, anteaters get on the ark, and one looks at the other and says, Two ants? Two ants? <laughs> That's funny. That's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. It's also cold here, or colder than I'd like. It's 58. Right. Uh, or 15 Celsius, and it just seemed to sneak up on me. It's awfully cold. <laughs> it happens. We do not have someone from Western Massachusetts today, but we have two guests who are from, I guess, sort of Eastern Massachusetts. Well, they can correct me. From the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Jeremy Luban, welcome back. Thank you so much, Vincent. Would you say Eastern Massachusetts? Is that correct? I th- I think most people call it central, Cent- but so it's, central? it's sort of it's it's east of uh, Alanine or Alanine, Alanine. Alanine. Very good. <laughs> south of Glycine <laughs> and west of Arginine. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from UMass Med in Worcester, Lanya Yorkovetsky. Welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me here. So Lanya is what people call you, but your actual name is Leonid, right? Leonid, Lanya, or Lonya, or Leo, people have their own ways of calling well, me. Well, we can, is Lanya like a, a familiar of Leonid? Is that Yeah, that yeah it it's the Russian familiar of Leonid. Oh, great. Well, welcome to TWIV. You are Thank a postdoc you. in Jeremy's lab, is that right? Yes. Yes, I'm a postdoc. Cool. And you guys are here because uh, we, we have uh, an interesting story. Which is all hush hush at the moment, right? <laughs> We're going to talk arg, about arg, was, arg. it. Was mentioned by Ned Landau not too long ago. Before we get to that, though, I have a couple of things to tell you. First, a meeting announcement: the Pan American Society for Clinical Virology, their regional meeting committee, is sponsoring two regional meetings this fall. They're mm-hmm. both called. Diagnostic Testing for HIV, Implementation, and Quality Assurance Tips for the Clinical Lab. And that will take place in San Diego on November 16th and in Houston on December 7th. And we will put links for each meeting in the show notes for the San Diego and the Houston meeting. 
and you could go check them out. And you know where the show notes are, right? Microbe.tv slash twiv. And we have one follow-up, which I thought we, we should read from about last week's episode. Rich Condit, why don't you read that? Frank writes, Dear Twiv Luminaries, in Twiv 515, you describe a case of vaccinia virus respiratory infection in Chinese workers exposed to the ground skin of rabbits, which had been inoculated with vaccinia. In Between Hope and Fear by Michael Kinch, uh, which was a science pick by Dixon in Twiv 511. Mm, that's right. Uh, the that's author deep. refers to a lecture by Jay Needham, uh, China and the Origins of Immunology, um, in which Needham describes, <clears throat> in Chinese tradition, the medical community had, at least prior to the year 1000 CE, adopted a, pra- a practice of nasal insufflation to prevent smallpox. The idea behind this procedure was to isolate scabs from individuals who had suffered relatively mild cases of smallpox. The children, uh, This material was dried and refined into a powder and blown into the nose of healthy children. <clears throat> uh, as just an aside, I've, I've been aware of this for a while, and it's always given me the creeps. <laughs> I can't imagine how that might turn out. Uh, our uh, Frank does imagine, however... These children might display some or all of the symptoms symptoms of a mild form of the disease, but the ancient Chinese recognized that they would be spared the severity of extreme scarring and death that might accompany an infection in later life. Perhaps this ancient practice has remained in folklore as a safe practice leading to lax worker safety. He's now rationalizing <laughs> how they could possibly... Uh, grind up infected rabbit skin in that paper that we did. As always, thank you for your for piercing our ignorance with your ever accessible and witty knowledge. From rumor to theory, we are lucky <laughs> you take us. Uh, we are lucky you take us betwix. I get it. <laughs> From rumor to theory, we are lucky you take us betwix. A twiv pun. A Twix pun. Cool. That's from Frank, retired science ranter. <laughs> I think that's supposed to be writer, right? <laughs> well. Maybe he's a ranter. Maybe he's a know. ranter. I'll just leave it. Yeah. Oh, it, probably it's a combination of writer and ranter. Yeah. Maybe a rancher. Oh, sure. Sounds about right. Yeah, that's cool. Well, you know, Rich, that procedure had like a 30% fatality associated uh, with it. Yeah. Inhaling uh, those. Uh, 30%? I, I, that's as high as the normal disease. Uh, uh, it may not, it may not have been 30%, but I can imagine it was, I, it just, uh, it was you know, it gives me the creep. Let's just yeah, say but, the FDA well, wouldn't approve it, it today. No. And it's not no. a procedure that it's not a procedure that hung on for a long period of time. But my understanding is the workers grinding up the rabbit skins didn't even know they were no, uh, infected. They didn't, right. They so no. Okay. All right. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we had Ned Landau on the show and um shortly afterwards jeremy sent me an email he said we have a paper on hush because ned at the end had mentioned hush and he sent it to me and uh, it is a nature microbiology paper and you know those of us those of you listening now do not get to hear the pre-show but we (laughs) we ranted about journals in the pre-show um but this one is in Nature Microbiology. It's a letter, so it's short. You can't have any discussion. Primate immunodeficiency virus proteins, VPX and VPR, counteract transcriptional repression of proviruses by the Hush complex. And Lonya is the first author, and Jeremy is the last, and others in between. And um, I said, okay, come, and, uh, come on and talk about it. So here we are, just a few weeks later, and that's the beauty of podcast we, we put our guests up. where our mouth is <laughs> that's right so and jeremy is this your third or fourth time on twiv i actually checked um <laughs> this is, it's i think it's number eight wow that's wow. impressive wow. you're almost a regular member it's very impressive group. now yeah. when you were here now jeremy used to be here at columbia he did and uh pretty much every day he would walk into my office you know yeah it was great very few people do that here <laughs> now, I must admit, I don't walk into other people's offices much, but that's because they don't walk into mine. But if they did walk into mine, I would walk into theirs. 
I ran into a guy in the elevator the other day, Rod Rothstein, who you both know. Yeah. I said, Rod, I haven't seen you in a long time. He said, yeah, my office is upstairs. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it's true. I got it. <laughs> it's true. But, and now, uh, actually, Jeremy, your advisor, former advisor, Steve Goff, walks into my office multiple times we, on we, the day. We, and we, when he's writing a grant, he's here a lot because he says, I'm, <laughs> I'm procrastinating. <laughs> so This is true. It's your eighth time. That's very good. Uh, yeah, I think so. I when when I was there, I don't think you had the wall of polio there, mm -hmm. uh, so it was probably much easier to get through the door. Um, <laughs> yes, there was no wall when you used to walk. You, there was a couch right by the door. I used to come in and sit on the on the arm. I remember that. Yeah, and it was much more appealing without the polio plates to to <laughs> open up your sandwich on yeah. your on your desk there. So, yeah. but uh, let you take it away, Jeremy. Tell us a story. Your okay, money. so I I thought if if we're going to talk about this paper, um, it might help to to give a background on it. So um, we mostly work on HIV, and I uh, just wanted to remind your listeners that HIV is a retrovirus, and like all retroviruses, it has three genes: um, the GAG, the Paul, and the envelope gene. Um, those genes are common to all retroviruses, and when HIV was uh, initially cloned and discovered in, uh, what was it, 1984, five, when it was cloned, um, it was found to have a number of additional reading frames, and these things have kept a lot of us very busy ever since. So <laughs> HIV has two uh, clearly essential regulatory genes, TAD and REV. They regulate transcription and expression um, of, of the genome and synthesis of the proteins is regulated by REV and all kinds of things happen there. Um, but then there are um, additional four, I think on the notes I wrote six, it's four additional accessory genes um, that were uh, quite mysterious. There weren't homologs for these things elsewhere, and uh, each of them has swallowed up many labs' uh, years' <laughs> worth of investigation. Um, I also wanted to, to point out that HIV-1, which is the, the virus that is pandemic that has traveled around the, the planet and has infected millions and millions of people, um, is just one of a very large family of viruses that are closely related. Um, they have in common that they're infecting primates. Um, so if you look in um, non-human primates in Africa, and it's only in Africa, uh, you find viruses closely related to HIV-1. Um, we generally call them SIVs or simian immunodeficiency viruses. Um, I don't know what the latest tally is, but it's somewhere around 40 different non-human primates have been shown to harbor viruses related to HIV-1. Mm -hmm. And from the standpoint of studying evolution, studying the host virus interface, it's a goldmine of uh, research opportunities because these, these viruses are evolving very rapidly. And it turns out that when you look in depth at the function of these, uh, these accessory genes that HIV-1 has and most of these other viruses have, uh, they seem to be evolving very quickly. And it's believed that most of these proteins, NEF, VPR, VPU, VIF, are making direct protein-protein interactions with uh, host factors, host proteins, excuse me. Uh, it's well-trained. Learned from TWIF. Um, I've learned two things from Vincent. Uh, <laughs> one is Just to two. call proteins proteins, <laughs> and the other is to only refer, to use the term expression when you're referring to transcription not to uh, expression of proteins. And I, I actually stick to these uh, as best I can. Um, I think they're useful uh, principles. Um, 
in any case, uh, Larry, uh, Jeremy, are you interruptible? Or are we gonna? No, of course. Okay. Please, okay. Please. So I have a question right away because you know you say Africa. Of course, it's limited to Africa. We know this, but there are primates all over the world. Lots yeah. of them in the New yeah. World. Yeah. Lots of them in the I Old wanna, World. I want to know that. Too. What the heck is up can with they be Africa? Okay, can, can New World monkeys be infected? I want to know that, but I also want to know why it hasn't spread at least over into India and places like that yeah. because of the trade that goes on between countries with regards to primates. So do we know the blocks to New World infection? Right. Is the, Wait a minute. The Indian monkeys are not New World. Uh, well, I want to know New World. Oh, well, I'm, I'm just curious as to why it hasn't gone through like uh, Indonesia. No, there, there are like, like six that. questions there, Jeremy. Go ahead. But just <laughs> yeah, yeah. why is it restricted to Africa? Let's say. And let's say I mean, there, there are, the more you get into it, the more incredible the whole field is. So, right. I mean, <laughs> uh, one question I ask all the time is, how did the, the primates, the non-human primates, get to South America? Because God, based on the biological <laughs> clocks, yeah. there are, and based on what we know about geology Limbs. and the, yeah. the structure of the planet and the continents and all of that, um, there were big bodies of water between the old world and the new world uh, when the separation occurred between yeah. these species. Yeah. This is true. So you would have to imagine that one of these teeny little – so all most of the primates in South America are, are quite small. Yes. So imagine – a little raft, like a, a leaf or something, <laughs> with two little monkeys crossing the ocean. Um, or a pregnant female. <laughs> yeah, so I think that separation, at least from the biological clock, is something like 50 million years ago, a little more maybe. Um, hmm. Whereas the, the continents are more in the order of 100 million in terms of their separation um, and the, the bodies of water that separated them. Um, so... So we have uh, been banging away at this question, uh, l just taking tiny, tiny steps. So um, the first, um, the first restriction factors, that is, uh, proteins that are present in the cytoplasm of of our primate cells that are interacting directly with. Uh, proteins encoded by these viruses were only found in the the early 2000s. So the Apobex were found in 2002, TRIM5 was discovered in 2004, and since then there's been a steady stream of new host factors that inhibit virus replication. Um, TRIM5, for example, makes a direct protein protein interaction with the capsid of the virus when it comes into the cell. And when you look as Harmeet Malik and Michael Emmerman did in a publication, uh, first author was Sarah Sawyer, who is now in Boulder and has her own lab. Um, they looked at the sequences of TRIM5 across primates, across the phylogenetic tree, and the part of the molecule, they identified a, a small part of the molecule of the protein coding sequence that was undergoing the fastest rates of evolution uh, in any part of the primate genome. And it turns out, while they were doing that computer analysis, the rest of us were banging away at the bench making mutants. And by uh, testing many, many mutants, many labs, we came to the conclusion that that exact little piece uh, that they had identified computationally is in fact the part of the TRIM5 protein that binds directly to the capsid. Mm. And these proteins are evolving rapidly. The viruses are evolving rapidly. And there's this, uh, it's been called an arms race, uh, as, as each uh, the virus tries to escape and the, the trims restrict. What we know is that um, is, is really anecdotal at this point in terms of your original question. So we know that um, uh, there are very potent blocks to infection of certain species uh, so, for example, HIV-1 uh, cannot infect Asian macaques because of the particular ortholog of TRIM-5 that most of those um, animals uh, possess. And um, it's a very, it presents a very potent block. The more we look, the more blocks we find. So, uh, there are polymorphic antiviral factors in the animals in South America and in Asia and, and throughout Africa. And um, 
very rarely one of these viruses manages to cross these uh, species-specific barriers and establish itself in a population of these animals. Um, so HIV-1 crossed over to people from, uh, we, we believe, and it's, there's really good evidence for this uh, based on sequence data, HIV-1 seems to have crossed over to people three, probably four times from chimpanzees that were infected with a very close relative that we call SIV CPZ or simian immunodeficiency virus from chimpanzee. Maybe one of the transmissions occurred to people through gorilla. There's an example of a gorilla virus that um, based on the phylogenetic tree clearly uh, links up with one of the uh, HIV clades uh, that transferred into people. Um, then there's HIV-2, which has also infected people. It's caused an epidemic, uh, not, not quite the world pandemic that HIV-1 has. But HIV-2, we believe, has crossed over to people at least 10 times. Um, separate transmissions from sooty mangabe monkeys, um, the SIVs that infect those animals in the wild, have infected people in various locations in Western Africa. Um, so we've, we've made, and many of us have made a living out of, um, tracking these blocks and characterizing them and trying to understand why one species is infectable and another is not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, this kind of analysis has taught us a lot about, um, how zoonoses work. That is how, how does a virus jump from one species to another? Uh, why doesn't it happen sometimes? Why does it happen other times? <clears throat> what does a virus have to leap over uh, in terms of genetic blocks to to make such a transition? Um, and then we we learn a lot about what the virus cares about um, to anthropomorphize the virus. Um, you know what are what are things on the way into a cell that are important to the virus? Or, what are immune blocks that a virus has to avoid? And uh, it's been an enormous uh, goldmine uh, of information about, about these kinds of things. And uh, Ned talked a little bit about this, um, but I think the kind of information we get is, is really going to be important to rationally design approaches to vaccinate people uh, against HIV. So, Jeremy, you said something that um, you might not have meant to say, but uh, you talked about antiviral proteins, and that's what I always translate the phrase uh, restriction factor to in my mind when I read it. But I just thought it, um, it's it's an interesting way because antiviral proteins implies a directionality to me that saying retro uh, restriction factor does not. So just it might help the listeners. Okay, so um, so restriction factors are um, re is a term that's that's widely used among people in our field. Um, I, I guess people outside may not be familiar with it. Um, it's been used to describe uh, essentially proteins in host cells that um, target specific proteins usually in, in, um, in viruses and have antiviral activities. So I think it's, uh, it's correct to call them uh, antiviral um, proteins <laughs> or factor. <laughs> uh, in most cases, they are indeed proteins and the targets are proteins. And, and what's been particularly rich from the evolutionary standpoint is, is that you can track the evolution of the interfaces of these proteins uh, across species. But uh, what we're talking about are antiviral activities. Uh, that is, these proteins somehow pose roadblocks for the virus as they traverse some critical step in their life cycle and prevent them from infecting. Um, so I don't know if, if I addressed your, your question. No, it was really more of a comment. I, th yeah. I think Vincent and I have talked about this in the past that, you know, restriction factor, antiviral protein, kind of the same thing. Yeah. No, I, I use them interchangeably. I 
uh, restriction factor. I like it. It's useful, but it is it it is problematic in that it it's kind of borrowed from from the prokaryotic literature. I mean, their restriction enzymes uh, pre- prevent phage from attacking bacteria. I think that's really um, it's a, a color colorful analogy, but it's really very different in terms of how we're using it. So uh, trim. This trim molecule that interferes with the capsid protein from HIV, is that on the surface of the cell so that it encounters it directly, or does it get inside the um, the uh, the endosome, the 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 inclusion vacuole that's created when the virus is taken into the cell? Right. So most of the so-called restriction factors um, are. The majority of them, the ones that we've uh, – certainly the ones that most attention has been focused on with respect to HIV-1 um, are intracellular. Intracellular. Uh, they, uh, some of them are membrane-associated. TRIM-5 is a protein in the cytoplasm, um, and retroviruses are all thought to traverse the cytoplasm um, when they come into the cell. Uh, generally, it's thought that a virus like HIV-1 fuses its membrane mm-hmm. directly with the plasma membrane and then releases a, a an RNA protein complex into the cytoplasm. And that complex has, has the two copies of the RNA genome, genomic RNA of the virus. It has critical enzymes like reverse transcriptase and integrase. Um, and then it has kind of a protective uh, chain mail coat, sort of like a knight, uh, to protect it from attack by enzymes in the cell, maybe to protect the nucleic acid from detection by uh, innate receptors um, mm-hmm. so that interferon is, is minimally or not activated. Yeah. Um, and so trim, so the, the capsid protein of HIV forms essentially a, a hexameric uh, a, a hexameric unit that then forms a more complex lattice. Um, and TRIM-5 forms a complementary hexameric lattice. This is work essentially from Wes Sundquist's uh, lab, Owen Pornilos, um, Mark Yeager, uh, and uh, Barbie Ganser have these amazing papers showing that TRIM-5, which is perhaps normally a dimer in the cytoplasm, gets induced to form a hexameric lattice that complements the capsid hexamer and um, forms kind of a a chain around it, um, perhaps strangulating it or disassembling it, um, but in effect, um, reverse transcription is blocked early as a result of that. So it traps it just as it fuses with the membrane of the host? As as the as fast as we can look, you can see um, the um, trim five is probably recognizing the capsid as it enters the cytoplasm. Got it. Um, kinetic experiments have uh, have been the effects have been as fast okay. as you can look, basically. Okay. So. Um, and I'm a little out of date with uh, keeping up with some of the trim five literature, but isn't there also some question about ubiquitin? Um, and proteasomal degradation of capsid? Yeah, so I think there's still many questions open about how the restriction mechanism works. The simple, um, the most simple uh, model is that there is, um, that the, the TRIM-5 complementary lattice disassembles the capsid lattice prematurely, prematurely from the standpoint of the virus, so that um, essential complexes perhaps fall apart and reverse transcription is blocked. Um, there is evidence that TRIM-5 may bring the core to, um, may, may promote um, ubiquitination for degradation of the capsid proteins, though that's, no one has actually shown that directly. Um, there, there are... Um, Paper suggesting that TRIM-5 is activating autophagy and sealing off the particles with membrane compartments. There also, I think that's quite controversial. Um, I think TRIM-5 
probably plays roles in autophagy, but it's not clear to me that anyone has shown that those are relevant for HIV's uh, restriction. Uh, we, we found uh, Thomas Pertel, uh, who was a student with me when I was in uh, Switzerland, demonstrated that the recognition of the capsid lattice by the TRIM-5 uh, dimer activates a, an E3 activity on the part of TRIM-5 such that it synthesizes chains of ubiquitin. But in this case, these are not linked on the lysine 48 that targets proteins for degradation in the proteasome. They uh, generate essentially free linear chains of ubiquitin that are linked on lysine 60, uh, 63 of ubiquitin. And those serve, uh, we demonstrated, um, in biochemical and genetic assays that those chains will activate uh, a kinase called TAC1 and that that somehow contributes uh, to restriction. We know that TAC1 activates NF-kappa-B and um, AP1 signaling. Um, a number of innate immune genes get turned on by this. Um, what happens at that point for the virus is not is not clear, and that's something we're still trying to to figure out. But um, but blocking TAC one will uh, decrease the efficiency of the restriction mechanism in our hands. Okay, that's really helpful, and now I feel less bad about having been so confused about it. Uh, it's <laughs> it it's it's not a, a complete story, and um, the biochemistry is complicated, and the. It's not just a simple protein-protein interaction. It's a, they're very large protein complexes, and there are nucleic acids involved. And so it's, it's, it's a rich area for further investigation, I'd say. <laughs> so when the, so, when, the vi- excuse me, when the virus buds off as it's replicating and then it goes out to infect another cell, are there um, – special membrane regions that it buds off from rather than just a generic it buds off from wherever it happens to be underneath the membrane or is there a yeah, specific so, organizational yes. yeah there are particular subdomains um, that's what i meant to say <laughs> in the membrane where where it buds from okay um so does uh, that set up the next infection and then determine where trim 5 can go um I'm not aware of any anything during the assembly process that influences the subsequent restriction um, other than the nature of the capsid. So okay. trim 5 recognition is, is uh, exquisitely <laughs> uh, specific for particular capsids. Oh. Um, and this is um, – this is another really rich area of investigation looking at the differences between viruses and between host species in terms of whether this recognition event occurs. Um, and that, that um, specificity is why HIV can infect, um, say, people, but not um, Asian macaques. Got it. So if we had their TRIM-5, we wouldn't get infected? That uh, that is the case, and people have proposed. We've done experiments in humanized mice, for example, where you you can protect the animals from HIV infection by putting in a transgene corresponding to the rhesus. Yeah. Um, All right. Yep. Exactly. All right. Um, so, anyway, um, this story that we wanted to talk about today involves VPR. Um, I thought it was kind of important before we talk about VPR to talk about this rich phylogeny of viruses because you can't really understand VPR if you don't appreciate that. That is, Mm -hmm. that there are 40 primate species that we know of um, that have viruses related to HIV-1. Each virus is slightly different, Mm -hmm. and one thing that they all seem to have in common is that they all have a VPR gene. Which stands for viral protein R, or (laughs) what does the Uh, VPR stand for? Something as trivial as that, yeah. Um, (laughs) I mean, you know, just (laughs) curious minds want to know. (laughs) Yeah, its name is is not informative uh, at all. Okay. (laughs) It was named when nothing was known about it, and um, it's just as well because 
Um, another accessory gene called NEF was named NEF because the people who named it thought it had negative effects on viral replication. <laughs> right. Uh, but it's exactly the opposite. Uh, Dixon, you want to hear a protein name that makes has nothing to do. We, we talked about this yesterday on Immune. There's a sensor called LGP2, Laboratory of Genetics and Physiology oh, Number for Two. God's sakes. How about that? <laughs> I hate it. I, I could even accept hedgehog, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, enough. <laughs> so anyway, these are very diverse uh, viruses. So the VPRs differ quite a bit across these viruses. And we have all suspected that that diversity may be driven by um, an arms race with the host. That is, if the VPR in all these different viruses is interacting, making direct protein-protein interactions with proteins in these different primate species cell cytoplasms, um, the virus may be forced to mutate uh, rapidly and to change the critical interfaces so that it can escape the antiviral activities of the host restriction factors. Now, there's a, there are many of these viruses, many of these primate species. There's a small sub-branch, <clears throat> which is um, primarily these um, sooty mangabe monkeys that are infected with an SIV that has a duplication, we think it's a duplication of VPR, so that not only do these viruses have VPR, but they also have a, a gene called VPX. And this is the uh, source of the zoonosis that we call HIV-2. That is, um, sooty mangabe monkeys in West West Africa that are infected with SIV SM, SM for sooty mangabe, um, these viruses have transferred into people um, at least 10 times. Two of those times, we think they spread person to person um, and established uh, epidemics, not as bad as it with HIV-1. But these are the only viruses that have um, VPX. But VPX has been really useful in terms of understanding what VPR does because they overlap in their functions, they share functions, um, they swap them, and they kind of evolve together. So um, I first got interested in VPR when I was uh, just starting my lab at Columbia uh, down, let's see, I was upstairs from Vincent at the time, I think. Um, Actually, I just started my lab. Um, I moved into a space that where David Shore had been. I don't know if Vincent remembers that. Yeah, sure. And yeah, 15, I just fifteenth. I just yeah. yeah, yeah. It was fifteen. I just got an email from David, uh, who's been in Geneva. He's actually going to come visit us at UMass over Thanksgiving and give a talk here. Um, mm -hmm. Just thought of it because it's a small world yeah, story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> It was through David that I first really learned how to do the two hybrid system, which led to our discovery of cyclophilin binding to capsid, which led to our discovery of trim five. It's whatever. Um, so um, a paper came out in, um, this was about 1993 from David Weiner's lab showing that if you uh, put HIV if you transduced HIV into a rhabdomyosarcoma cell line, the morphology of the cells changed uh, drastically. Hmm. And I was really struck by that. There was a, it was a cell paper. There was this amazing picture on the cover. And um, the first postdoc to work with me, uh, Fabio Ray, had just arrived. He was very interested in, in cancer and transformation. And so he decided to look at the effects of VPR on the cell cycle, and he demonstrated um, that when you, you put VPR into a cell, the cell cycle is arrested in a very discrete point in the cycle, which is at the end of G2, before the cell goes into mitosis. And um, at the same time, there were um, at least three other labs that found the same thing. So Ned Landau um, had a paper almost back-to-back -back with ours in Javier uh, reporting the same thing. 
Uh, Michael Emmerman was on to this, and Irvin Chen's lab also had uh, papers about this. So this was 1995, these papers came out. And um, ever since we've been trying to figure out, the field has been trying to figure out in earnest um, how VPR causes cell cycle arrest. And I would argue that we still don't know how it does it. Um, a couple of years later, um, this would have been about maybe 2007 or so, I think there were seven labs that published papers all, all in the same year, all independently. One of them was Ned Landau's lab, showing that VPR cell cycle ar arrest required that VPR bind to a protein called DCAF1. And DCAF1, they showed, was an adapter for CUL4, which is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so the implication was that VPR was acting as a kind of adapter for a host protein. Hmm. The host protein would, via this adapter function, get uh, localized to an E3 ubiquitin ligase, get ubiquitinated and degraded. This uh, putative factor must be some kind of cell cycle regulator. And there have been many papers over the years reporting protein X, protein Y, and nothing has held up uh, across multiple labs uh, that explains this phenotype. So that's, that is a, a question that I think is really exciting that really remains to be, to, to be answered. What is the, the target of VPR that causes cell cycle arrest? Mm. Another, we, so a number of groups have shown that it has something to do with DNA damage. Um, I think that's pretty clear, uh, but the details of that remain to be worked out. Um, another detail about this VPR cell cycle arrest is that it's unique to HIV-1 and its closest relatives. So it is not the cell cycle arrest is not a property that you see in the broad range of VPRs all the way out in the phylogeny of SIVs, and that becomes relevant in, in Lanya's story, um, which we'll tell you in uh, a few minutes. So, <laughs> right so after I have this to, word from our sponsor. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> in, um, so I had a, a, a postdoc working with me after Fabio named Andrea Cimarelli. Uh, he was working on virus assembly and he, he was very successful. He had, uh, I think he had five Javier papers, and he got himself a job in Lyon at the Ecole Normale Supérieure there, and he started working on vectors. That is, HIV vectors. These are sort of reductionist pieces of, of HIV that you can use to deliver genes to cells. HIV is a very effective uh, gene delivery tool. And he was interested in vaccination and dendritic cells, which are the most, perhaps most important antigen presenting sentinel cell in the immune system, were a target that he looked at. And he found that they were extremely resistant to transduction by HIV vectors. In contrast, if he used vectors from SIV. MAC 251. Now, this was a lab virus. Originally, it was probably an, a sooty mangabe virus that was studied in primate centers and then was passed through Asian macaques that are not normally infected by these viruses. Hmm. Um, and this virus uh, is has been a workhorse model for AIDS pathogenesis. So, if you if you give this African virus from Sooty Mangabe that's been adapted a little bit in the lab, if you give that to an Asian macaque that's never evolved with this virus, they predictably get AIDS um, in a, a very rapid uh, course, and the disease looks very much like AIDS in people. So that's been the main animal model uh, that's been used over the, over the years to study antiviral therapies, to study vaccination. Um, so, Andrea 
noticed that uh, dendritic cells, also other so-called myeloid cells like macrophages, were resistant to HIV, but SIV vectors could transduce them. And so he hypothesized that this might be a block like TRIM5 in the cytoplasm of the cell. And we knew with TRIM5 that if you put in a lot of capsid particles, maybe these, do, these particles don't have to be infectious, they can just be empty particles, you can saturate the antiviral protein and allow infectious particles to get through. So he tried to do that uh, with HIV, that is he put in a whole lot of HIV particles to see if they would rescue HIV on the dendritic cells and it didn't work. And as part of that experiment, he had a control. So we knew that in these saturation experiments, they are, as I said before, the restriction is exquisitely sensitive, uh, is exquisitely specific. So if you want to saturate um, TRIM5's restriction of HIV-1, you have to use HIV-1 capsids. You can't use SIV MAC capsids. It won't work. So as a control for specificity, he used SIV capsids, and he got exactly the opposite result that he expected. That is, the SIV rescued the HIV. So he intended to saturate with HIV capsids. That didn't work, but the um, heterologous SIV capsids worked. Hmm. And that was a puzzle. Um, but he didn't let that bug him. Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing where you might just stop and say, oh, it didn't work, blah. Um, he said, well, there must be something in the SIV that's, that's protecting HIV or allowing HIV to replicate. So he mapped, he made mutants in the SIV particles, and he found that the critical factor in SIV was the SIV VPX hmm. gene. <laughs> so... It's now become standard in all of the experiments, for example, that Ned Landau spoke about uh, when he was on TWIV uh, a couple of weeks ago, where he's transducing dendritic cells with HIV. They're all dependent on so-called virus-like particles, empty, non-infectious SIV particles that deliver VPX right. to the cells. And so that's been a really important tool for us um, to transduce dendritic cells and, and, and other cell types. Um, so then a couple of labs found that this effect of VPX, its ability to rescue HIV, <coughs> required the same ubiquitin ligase complex that was required for VPR G2 arrest. Hmm. So... It was shown that DCAF1, the adapter protein, binds to VPX, as it did to VPR, and that then recruits the call for ubiquitin ligase machinery. So that suggested that VPX, analogous to VPR, <clears throat> was recruiting some antiviral factor that was active in a cell type-specific way. So it was most important in dendritic cells, but maybe not cycling T cells. And then two labs, uh, you'll notice all these things are, are done in groups, uh, competing with each other in hopefully healthy fashion. <laughs> uh, two labs in 2011 reported that the target of VPX is a protein called SAMHD1. Those two labs are Yatsek Skaransky, um, and the other lab is um, Monsef Ben Kiran. And they both showed that a protein called SAMHD1 um, is, has an activity in dendritic cells that inhibits reverse transcription uh, when HIV tries to infect, when it enters the cytoplasm of one of these dendritic or, or macrophage cell types. And here, the story is very complicated probably going forward, but the, the standard understanding that we have now is that SAMHD1 degrades DNTPs that are required for reverse transcription. So reverse transcriptase takes the viral RNA genome, uses it as a template, 
and makes a polymer of the NTPs, and the product of that is the viral cDNA. And that's what so, that's what Ned talked about, right? On, yes. On yeah. yeah. Again, when I was in Switzerland, um, Thomas Pertel fa- um, looked at dendritic cells and looked at HIV transduction of dendritic cells. In the presence, the the new thing that he did was he looked in the presence of an antiviral state induced by interferon. So he treated the dendritic cells with interferon or other things like lipopolysaccharide that activate an antiviral state in dendritic cells. And if he did that and hit those cells with HIV, they were absolutely uninfectable. But if he added VPX containing SIV virus-like particles, he could rescue infection even in the face of this Mm. interferon um, antiviral state. And so we characterized this in detail, and we came to suspect that there were additional targets of VPX that um, were beyond just the SAMHD1 um, target. And so we embarked, um, in fact, this is a project that was really directed by Caterina Strombio de Castilla um, in Geneva, working with Gerard Huffgardner and Emmanuel Varezio. They set up a proteomic screen of dendritic cells that were treated with empty VLPs or VLPs containing VPX and looked in a completely unsupervised proteomics screen for host proteins that were altered in their levels by VPX. This is a massive project. And we came up with a large list of potential candidates and we're still working those up. And um, this is really where Lanya comes into the story and where I get to shut up. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) when um, Lanya, Lanya came to my lab He started setting up assays um, to look at the effect of VPX um, on on functions that that we would predict would be disrupted by VPX. And um, I don't know, Lanya, do you want to take over at this point? Uh, Sure, yeah. Before you do, Lanya, tell us a little bit about your history. Where where are you from and how you got here and all that? (laughs) I'm, I, I guess I'm originally from uh, Massachusetts. I mean, I, I, I guess I was born in this country called Moldova. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I moved to. Hmm? You say you guess, but you're not sure. Uh, well, <laughs> the place that I'm from, it's it broke away from Moldova, so it's not technically called Moldova uh, anymore. Got it. So it's a breakaway region in the in Russia. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I moved to America in '91, uh, and I grew up in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I went to well, undergrad. How old were you at that in '91? I was six and a half. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Six and a half. Yeah. Uh, that's my age. Uh, then I moved to. Um, <laughs> I went to. I went to college at, at Brandeis University uh, near here, also just down the street. Um, and then I went to do grad school at University of Chicago. Mm. Um, and there, well, right before I went to the University of Chicago, I, I first teched in the lab of Tatyana Golovkina, mm-hmm. who's a retrovirologist uh, who studies mouse retroviruses and that kind of gave me the first bug for retrovirology kind of but I ended up joining the lab of uh, Dr. Alexander Chervonsky um, who studied uh, autoimmunity um, also in mice specifically type 1 diabetes Uh, in that lab I did my project was kind of on the uh, sexual dimorphism of autoimmunity and how your gut microbiota and microbiome modulates the sexual dimorphism of type 1 diabetes in our mice. Uh, so that was a very uh, not straightforward way to go. But after I finished my uh, PhD there, I realized I was really still really interested in retroviruses and their connection to the evolution of everything and transposons and endogenous retro elements and stuff like that. So I really wanted to... Um, get a, a handle on how exogenous retroviruses really work in the molecular level and get more training in molecular virology, especially to do with retroviruses. And uh, I've, I knew about Jeremy's work and I was uh, 
and I ended up going to his lab um, to learn about molecular retrovirology. Do you remember uh, how far back you were interested in science? Uh, since I would say about high school, I science was always those were my favorite classes. I was really bad at biology always. <laughs> I got my undergrad degree was in chemistry, and in college, my worst grades were always in biology classes and genetics classes. <laughs> but um, once I came to U Chicago, and I kind of started to understand that biology is just functional chemistry <laughs> uh, it kind of changed my view on it and Love i it. became really really excited about it um, so somewhere somewhere in your information i think it said that your maybe your thesis work was on environmental factors influencing uh type 1 diabetes is have i got that right yes yes yeah so uh so what's the status of viruses in type 1 diabetes this mm. goes in and out Oh, uh, if memory serves, um, <laughs> there's been a lot of association with viruses possibly being an environmental trigger for some uh, for some uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, right. In mice, people thought that maybe retroviruses could possibly contribute to it, or enteroviruses. There are definitely models where you can induce type one diabetes or autoimmune like diseases with viral infections. So that, but the conclusively, I don't think that's been. Um, uh, okay, uh, no smoking gun yet. Yeah, yeah. We were. More, I was more interested about this holistic microbiota effect, okay. and if right. we modulate microbiota, uh, I was always interested in the virome, microvirome, but we never got to do those experiments uh, at the time. Okay. It was mostly bacteria. Good. So you're in Jeremy's lab. <laughs> yeah, and I joined Jeremy's lab, and uh, I was learning how to clone, how to work with retroviruses, how to, and it was very exciting. And uh, I was trying to continue uh, this project that, that identified a number of targets of VPX. And I was trying to set up systems to test the effect of VPX on these other uh, functions that were suggested by the hit. And so I was trying to basically express the gag protein in conjunction with VPX to see if there was an effect on that gag protein. Um, and it was GFP tagged so that I could measure the level of uh, the protein in one cell, and then I had control cells that were expressing just the protein or the protein with BPX from this vector, which is kind of the first figure of the paper, um, where we use a dual promoter vector with one promoter, the SSFB driving our antigen, our GAG GFP, and then a second promoter, SIPA, driving our protein that's modifying or somehow impacting uh, the GAG GFP, which is BPX. Um, and my first experiments with this system uh, were kind of inconclusive, and they were very strange. I transduced, if you look at the paper, the first experiment's kind of described, it's kind of hidden in the first figure. Um, but what I saw was that if I transduce cells with this GFP reporter uh, in the absence of um, VPX, you see that uh, in figure 1B, you can see that there's very low GFP expression from the cells, but in uh, when VPX was present uh, right below that 18% figure, there's the 50% figure, you can see that there was a lot of GFP expression. Um, and this was very strange to me. And so I tried to talk to other people in the lab, and I was like, is this normal? Are you supposed to see such a big effect on expression? Because I've read that there is some kind of restrictions to transgene expression with retroviruses so, or other. So I would, I want to interrupt to say that this was really annoying. <laughs> uh, this was the, I mean, this, another person would have defined this as a technical problem. That is, he couldn't normalize the expression under these two conditions. So he couldn't do the experiment he set out to do. And, um, to his enormous credit and his uh, prepared mind, uh, he he wanted to know he wanted an explanation for this annoying result, and that's what led to this whole project, which basically uh, happened because he he bothered to think about it. He could have just gotten frustrated and said, "Oh, I can't do what I wanted to do when I set out to do this," um, but he went he went with it. And decided to try and figure it out. So let me understand this. So the the expression of GFP mm -hmm. completely dependent on VPX. That was not 
seen before. Yeah, it, it was. It's not that it's completely dependent. It's just the v, presence of EPX really increases, increases the signal. It. Okay, and, and it's, is the promoter here that you're using important? Uh, a little bit. Um, with other promoters, you have less basal expression, so like the fold effect of VPX is different. Okay. But it seems some of the promoters I tested, I tested uh, EF1 Alpha small promoter and the thymidine kinase promoter and a few other ones, ubiquitin promoter, and it seemed that the trend was always the same, that the VPX would increase the expression of uh, my transgene and, okay. and, my, and, my, and my cells. All right. So uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, fundamental questions about the assay, because you're um, trans transfecting in a reporter plasmid, and yet you interpret your uh, results as uh, induction of provirus transcription. Mm -hmm. And I think of a no, provirus no, 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 wait. as... You used the wrong word. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. It was. Okay. It's not a transfection. Everything is being transduced, so they're okay. all they're, they're all, all the products of retroviral infection. Fine. So, so all of the transcription happens for those. Uh, the uh, contents of those particles integrate. So we are looking at proviral transcription. Yes. So the other question is, what you're looking at ultimately is. A signal from a protein, uh, and yet the interpretation is that uh, you're seeing a transcriptional effect. That strikes me as a leap of faith. Was there a trail of experiments in between? Yes. So this, uh, yes, there was. Uh, we I did test by uh, qPCR that it, it is actually being induced, uh, right. and that it didn't have to do with the. Uh, that I was just integrating more virus that the VPX, because VPX, I was using jerk out cells that don't have the same HD1 restriction. So it's not that I was transducing at a higher uh, amount, that there's more transduced cells. So that's why there's more GFP. Okay, uh, and then so the, you, showed, you showed directly that it was transcriptional. Yeah, yeah. And then I just used the GFP as a readout for mm -hmm. um, the transcriptional uh, effect later on in the, in the paper. Good, good. That, that was a, a, a really important question. That was great. Yeah. So you you ask people what's going on here. How'd you sort that out? Uh, so I tried to complement those that vector by either the one that did that had repressed expression by either introducing VPX as a transgene before transduction of the cells, which is also in that figure, or as Jeremy mentioned, you can add mm. uh, the VLPs containing VPX and trans, and you'll see the same effect if that is being mediated by VPX. So it can be expressed either as transgene or added as a protein kind of in a particle and it will re it, it'll change the expression to a high mm -hmm. high level of expression, which is what it's really three experiments in that one B. But um uh yeah. So basically you can complement this in any way as long as VPX is there for this vector that we use, the GFP stays on pretty, pretty high. Okay. So what'd you do next? So next, uh, I thought that this was a very interesting, and so it, it kind of in a way to, um, uh, uh, to, to I, I wanted to, I wanted to test kind of evolutionary this, this function because as Jeremy said that uh, I think he's mentioned that only red cap mangabees have a VPX, but actually a few other uh, monkeys have VPX. Uh, mandrill, mandrills have uh, mandrill two uh, virus has a VPX also. The dr uh, and the red cap mangabees also have uh, a VPX in addition to VPR molecule. And generally for the activity of SAMHD1, um, it's very species specific in that the red cap mangabee VPX will degrade the red cap mangabee uh, SAMHD1, but it will not degrade the human one. Uh, and same for the mandrill uh, uh, VPX. And so I wanted to test whether um, this holds true for our system. So is this factor, in a way, I was trying to rule out same HD1, even though these cells really shouldn't have same HD1. Mm. And so I transduced these cells. Um, so I, I set up a system where I could basically transduce, I can replace the VPX with BLASTI. So I have basically a stable cell line that expresses GFP at a low level across the entire population. And I can transduce them with different VPXs to see whether um, the GFP expression goes back up. 
Got it. Right, so it de-represses it. And so it was a pretty nice system, and this kind of goes back to what Jeremy was saying, that some of the VPRs are actually toxic. But the first experiment I did with the Red Cap Manga Bee and the Mandrill VPX, and to my surprise, uh, both of them de-repressed the GFP expression, and you, and you had a lot of GFP, kind of like in, in 2D. Um, uh, and that was very strange because um, that wasn't supposed to happen <laughs> from the literature uh, that I had read. Uh, in that a lot of these factors are supposed to be very species specific that the 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 virus proteins counteract. Mm-hmm. And so I went on this um as you can see in the bottom of the figure E, I started testing the furthest related VPRs and VPXs to find determinants maybe of uh this activity. Um and I started going down the list of the VPXs and VPRs that we had in the lab. I tested them and some of them were very far apart, like the mustache monkey ones. Um, and those were showed one of my also, favorite primates, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other one is the one with the big nose, <laughs> Jimmy Durante. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so like Borneo, as I recall. And sorry, uh, no, uh, and, and and those also seem to have activity. And when I tried to start aligning the ones that had the activity in, in my assays to the ones that didn't, I couldn't tell anything because they are so different between each other. If you align all these VPXs and VPRs, there's only about 23, 25% amino acid conservation. And even if you take only the ones that do have activity, um, it's only, it's very small percentage conservation. So I could never really find Hmm. sites that were very specific to the VPX or VPR that is able to degrade or it's not, or the ones that aren't, um, which was kind of confusing. (laughs) Degrade SAM HD1, you mean, right? Well, in relation to the same HD1 or my activity, degrading whatever factor, we Got hypothesize it. that yeah. there's a factor kind of like uh, Andrea that VPX is degrading, um, uh, which we showed later in the DCAF1 experiments, uh, that there is indeed a, some factor that's um, being degraded by VPX. Got it. Okay. Um, so should I keep going? Keep or? going. Okay. You're on a okay. roll. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this this was really interesting, and I started reading literature about repression of retroviruses, and that led me to Steve Goff's work. And uh, the classic papers were in embryonic stem cells or embryonal teratoma cells that if you transduce with MLV or certain viruses, that they get silenced really, really fast. And this was due to TRIM-28 silencing by TRIM-28 recruiting SETDB1 and uh, modifying the histones, um, causing a repressive state and you don't see the GFP or the reporter expression there. Mm -hmm. And so in those experiments, if you block histone deacetylases, HDAC inhibitors, uh, with histone deacetylase inhibitor drugs, that you could see the de-repression of your contract. So it was dependent on this first histone modification step. And that's not in the paper, but I tested that, and I had the same exact thing, that if I used HDAC inhibitors, it blocked the repression of my of my provirus. And so uh, that led me to try to set up a screen for factors that were known to either um, regulate uh, transcriptional silencing or post-transcriptional silencing events. And that's kind of what figure two is about. And we chose a number of factors of um, they were associated. I, I thought maybe it might be due to small RNA mediated interference or uh, DNA methylation, like in some other cases, or these other histone-modifying proteins. And another group of proteins that we chose to test was this HUSH complex group. And the reason the HUSH complex was very interesting to test was that I was seeing if this was specific to our promoter, which is SSFV promoter. And when I Googled uh, silencing of SSFV promoter, it came up with that original HUSH paper from uh, the Learner Lab, uh, where they showed that a contract that was very similar to the one that we were using, uh, but in different cell types, was being repressed by this HUSH complex. And so when I screened all these different target sites, uh, surprisingly, um, the HUSH complex was the one that was seemed to be most responsible for silencing our um, our vector. Tell us what HUSH is. Uh, so HUSH is... <laughs> I'm sorry. I always forget. Um, it's it's the human silencing hub complex. So that makes sense, Dixon, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm well, lost you want in the transcript to be very, very quiet. <laughs> I I have been. I thought. <laughs> no, the transcript. Not you. Are oh, going to oh. be tra- are going to be very, very quiet because of the hush complex. Got it. Yeah. So this brought up another interesting. Uh, 
uh, point, I guess, was that the the way that the hush complex was identified was using a positional effect of irrigation screen uh, in 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 human cells, where they they it's always been kind of noticed that if some populations of integrated proviruses get repressed really really quickly, and it's thought that it's because they were integrate into heterochromatin. And so the the group, what they did was they they set up a, a, a screen where they identified this fast silencing population of cells. I assorted them out and then did, I think the first one was a gene trap mutagenesis screen with MLV. Uh, and and they identified the hush complex was what was responsible of repressing transient expression in heterochromatin. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was always kind of strange to me because um, in our case, we're using a lentiviral vector uh, and lentiviral vectors generally don't, they not, they don't prefer to integrate into heterochromatin. They really like to integrate into euchromatin and inter- intergenic re- regions, even though I think 10% or hmm. some number around there does integrate uh, into heterochromatin. Um, and, uh, and HUSH works by methylating heterochromatin right yeah so from my understanding of how the hush complex works is that in in the heterochromatin is that when the transgene makes a lesion between an already silent uh, heterochromatic region which has which is marked by h3k9 trimethylation marks Mm -hmm. um, these proteins uh, mpp8 is a is a reader and it reads the h3k9 trimethylation mark and recruits hmm. the rest of the complex, which reinforces this silent or heterochromatic mark state across the new lesion uh, that, that that's integrated uh, into the heterochromatin. Okay. So you were telling us you had hush as part of the hush complex as part of your screen, right? You're looking at you're using RNAi to look for proteins that are involved in your repression, right? Yeah, it was a SHRNA screen. SHRNA yeah. screen, yeah. All right. So, and what did you find? So we found that uh, even the SEDDB1, which is part of the hush complex, had a mild effect on our repression. It was mostly dependent on the other factors that were described, which were uh, PWE, uh, I mean, uh, FAM208, which is Taser, M-phosphate, MPP8, and peripheralin one uh, All the genes are kind of strange uh, to me. Um, and MORC2. MORC2 was the other. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> More, uh, he said as his nose got longer <laughs> uh they're all very interesting genes there are also some of them were identified in previous uh screens the one that was really interesting to me was uh, it was uh the, by the white law lab where they were screening for transgene uh expression in mice it, they they made a mouse that had uh concatenator of gfp expression and they were doing ENU mutagenesis in mice. I think this is one of the first like a PV screens in mice. Uh, and they identified a number of candidates that were, when there was mutations induced by ENU, that led to increased expression of GFP in the in their mice. And mm-hmm. Taser and FAM208 actually came up in that screen also. And, and that was uh, really exciting and, and kind of connected this whole thing together. Um, other interesting tidbits about this complex, if you want to know. Uh, some of them are embryonically lethal in um, in mice, so they seem to be uh, might be very important in developmental processes. Uh, and some of these, the Lerner Lab also came out with another paper last year, I think, about MORC2 and MORC2 was um, I, I don't think we sent you that paper, uh, but it was uh, associated with um, uh, I always forget the uh, the the disease the Marie Charcot Marie Tooth disease, which is a neurological mm. disease, mm, right? Right. So this component seems to be also involved in uh, neuronal development or regulation, also like that. Wh- whether the whole complex is involved in that, I, I'm I'm not quite sure. So you have your assay, and yep. you have VPX has an effect, and knocking down Hush has an effect, mm-hmm. right? When you put the two of them together, it's the same, right? Uh, it's similar. similar. Yeah, there. It, it's similar. It's not. Maybe under some conditions, there's a small effect, but qualitatively, they they okay. they look very similar. So at that point, mechanistically, what are you thinking is going on? Well, that's kind of where I. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I think that. <laughs> so I I think that uh, once the 
so there's different events. So before integration, there are uh, associations with the incoming provirus, the cDNA, the proviral cDNA, before it integrates. And I, um, and I was really excited about again. Steve Goss Lab published that um, that the histones get loaded onto the proviral cDNA after it translocates from the cytoplasm into the mm-hmm. nucleus. Right. Right. Uh, and that maybe the, those histones can be modified before integration or after integration. I'm not sure exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to, Jeremy. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I actually, so we checked with Steve. You can keep going. Yeah. You can talk oh. about his, okay. his so, result. So Steve has this story. We, we heard at Cold Spring Harbor that's not not uh, published yet, but he I, gave us permission yeah. to talk and about I, it. He, when he walks in here three times a day, he tells me about that all the time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not so hush-hush in a local sense. Yeah, but right. he, said, he said it was you know, okay. All the time, yeah. you know, I, I have to give you the perspective of someone who's listening to this without understanding any of it, and yet still getting a clear picture of what what happened for the event which allowed this virus to go from monkeys to pe- people. What was the trigger that allowed that particular virus to get in? And all the others kept trying and none of them got in. Is it one of these factors that you're talking about or is it a trim event or is it a, I mean, what was the thing that you think Mm -hmm. allowed this thing to take off the way it did? Because it really took off. Uh, Was that a good question or a bad question? No, it's a, it's a great great question. question. We need another uh, podcast to answer. Maybe we yeah. should get uh, Beatrice Hahn on to, to tell us more yeah, about she it. Would, she would be wonderful. Um, I mean, it, it jumped to people from chimps, and chimps are yeah. are quite close to us. They are. Um, They're and not as close as the, gorillas. <laughs> the creature that that jumped into chimps, uh. um, so it's thought that the virus that has infected chimps is a recombinant between two other SIVs. That is, some unfortunate chimp at some point probably ate two different monkeys, <laughs> each of which were infected with an SIV that managed to somehow come together God. and recombine oh, in no. some poor chimp. Wow. And um, I guess that's the chump chimp <laughs> or some chump. Ch- <laughs> the chomped chump chimp. Yeah. <laughs> and um, wow. so there, there were... Uh, very large adaptations that had to be made um, in the virus, in the two viruses that came into that chimp. So <clears throat> remember, there are, there were at least these four proteins that are made by these viruses that are inhibiting antiviral proteins in the cells. Right. And each of these are moving targets on the evolutionary scale. Yeah. So we know of a couple of examples um where there are mismatches or things that are incompatible. Um, but So we know that there were changes that had to occur in the virus to accommodate the chimp as a host. And then what happened for the virus to jump from chimps to humans is, is a little bit less clear. There are some changes that have been noticed. Um, I'm not sure uh, how clear any of those are as being really important. Um, it may simply be that the viruses had changed enough and they were ready for humans. Mm-hmm. And the reason it took off is because of um, various uh, socioeconomic issues. Right. Um, right, right. I mean, is, is, is sooty macaques, or no, I'm sorry. Sooty mangabees. So, so, sooty mangabees, are they particularly delicious to humans? They're pets. They're pets. They're pets. Yeah, they're mostly pets. There's even pets. there's a there's okay. a paper. Okay. The most recent evidence for transmission from the sooty manga bee is I there's a paper maybe five ten years ago, and I don't remember if it's from Beatrice or Preston Marks. They found a, a child I think in Cameroon um, who was infected with what looks like SIV sooty manga bee. At least the sequences are, mm. you know, fit perfectly in the in the mm-hmm. tree. Mm-hmm. And they have no other information. They were unable to track how this child got infected, but mm. presumably from from a pet. Wow. Um, okay. Perhaps they they had mm. they had some bush meat. So let me get back to Lanya. I will, yeah, I'm sorry. So, so Lanya, you you're thinking at this point is that somehow VPX is degrading. 
these hush components, right? Now, mm. and, and, and why you thought of that, I guess, because of the SAM HD1 degradation, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So how did you check, how did you test that? So we tested that by just, uh, I ran the lysates from uh, cells expressing, overexpressing uh, these different BPXs uh, and looked to see which components were um, depleted the most. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out that, out of, it, so the complex seems to regulate itself. So in the knockdowns, uh, if you knock down any one of the components, it seems to destabilize the other components. But you could tell from... Uh, um, from the overexpression in, 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 in 2E, that the FAM208, the taser, was degraded the most in, in these expression experiments, uh, mm -hmm. and not the other ones, if you, do, if you do the percentages. So it seemed like it was taser that was, or FAM208, that was being degraded by the, the VPX. And we could do these short, uh, quick experiments in, in, in G where I could show that this was dependent on DCAF1 also, um, like, like Jeremy said, like a lot of the VPX and VPR seem to function, uh, that I can just expose the cells with, for, with the VLPs for a few hours in the presence or absence of DCAF1, and you can see that Taser or FAM208 is only degraded by the VPX-containing VLPs in a DCAF1-dependent fashion, and it's pretty quick. Okay. And so how, how does this degradation happen? What's going on? And then there's uh, so, also proteasome inhibitor experiments that extended that. Yeah, and so it, we think it might be functioning a lot like the other targets of VPR and VPI degradation in that uh, it's adapting them to um, being degraded by DF1 and the CUL4 um, uh, proteasome ubiquitin ligase system. Um, yeah, whether I, I'm not sure whether there are other groups of factors that are regulated by DF1 and CUL4 themselves, and are uh, I'm not sure whether the hush components themselves are regulated by this component in that VPX is increasing their turnover or if they're redirecting them into this other degradation pathway. That I, I can't exactly answer. Okay. okay. Th this is becoming a really common theme. There must be now dozens of examples of viral immuno immunomodulatory proteins that, uh, as their mechanism, are proteins that target cellular proteins for degradation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I'll agree too. <laughs> so, what else in this paper do you want to mention, Lanya? What What other findings do you think are are notable? Um. So, I guess. Well, I that our reporter was kind of like a, a artificial system with the you know uh, the guts of a lentivirus, and mm -hmm. wanted to see if there was a real effect on uh, lentiviral like normal, not normal, but HIV LTR driven expression and kind of more uh, something more similar to the real virus. And so people use these JLAT lines or lines of latency where you have a single integrated clone of the, uh, a single clone cell of a single integration site. And there's usually very low expression from that uh, transgene or LTR driven construct. Uh, but if you and they're used to screen to identify drugs that can reverse latency or factors that contribute to latency. Uh, and so we tested to see whether um, VPX could upregulate expression from these latent cells. And we chose, uh, I tested a bunch of them. We showed the best one, which was actually described by the learner group to be hush sensitive. So we kind of knew that this line was hush sensitive. So VPX, if it is degrading hush, uh, that it should be responsive to um, the presence of VPX. And it was, and that's mm -hmm. B. Uh, and then in mm -hmm. D, which was kind of interesting, we have uh, a grad student in the lab, Sean mm -hmm. uh, McCauley, who really loves to destroy HIV uh, molecularly. And he makes all these really interesting constructs. And he had developed this really nice construct where he kind of cut out the guts of the virus and replaced it with GFP, but kept all the normal splicing events kind of mm -hmm. uh, of the virus. So it, it was a really nice reporter. And I could just transduce a population of cells in the presence or absence of VPX, or just uh, or the other experiment where I, we showed in the paper, where I can make a pool of these uh, polyclonal uh, cells, where they all have different integration sites, to see whether is there a bigger effect of the hush complex on LTR-driven expression from many different integration sites, mm -hmm, uh, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what E is. And you can see that it, uh, it does seem to have a pretty big effect, kind of similar to the JLAT A1 line, on many different integration sites. Uh, both VPX and the FAM208, uh, which is the target of the um, VPX activity. The fact that you can play with this system the way you've just described it, does that mean you understand all the components? And now that there's 
uh, you can show this with a re- with a latent normal a latent normal um, HIV virus. Does that mean that there are no other uh, players in this game, and that you can go ahead and describe the uh, the derepression of latency then based on no. the X? No, there are so many different um, <laughs> <laughs> components to latency. Oh, uh, I see. <laughs> and, and, and like, I, I bet a lot of them are additive, and a lot of them are dependent on the site of integration. Um, and okay. you know, okay. so in, it, this does have a big effect on our reporter, but on the f- actual latent proviruses that are in patients, I don't. We don't know yet w- what the effect is. We're, we're playing. We're doing those experiments. So, if you had no VPX in HIV one, mm-hmm. would would it not be able to become a provirus and, and express? No, it will. It's uh, so in, in the jump that um, the recombination event that Jeremy was saying for. Uh, I should have brought this up earlier, but in the recombination event that happened um, from the Sudi manga bees or the red cap manga bees, uh, which infected the chimpanzees, mm. the the virus that virus, the original virus, had VPX and VPR, and it's thought that it lost the VPX or and that the VPR was retained. And we know in that in that virus that VPX is the uh, is the one that is degrading. Um, uh, FAM two hundred eight taser, mm-hmm. whereas the VPR that from the red cap manga bees, I, we don't have that in, in in this in the paper, but it was shown by the Learner Lab and by um, uh, the of um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing in uh, Francois's the, the, paper. Yeah, Francois's paper. Yeah, that human HIV one VPR does not degrade. Um, uh, FAM 208. So the ancestral virus that okay. HIV 1 came from did not have this activity. And I, I showed not in the paper, but I've shown that the gorilla and the chimpanzee VPRs also uh, don't have that activity. All right. But um, then, but human cells have hush. But human cells have hush. Yeah. So why does HIV, why do HIV proviruses express? Why are they not silenced? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, <laughs> the. <laughs> Well, I mean, in these jumps to the uh, to different species, they could have adapted to deal with this in other ways. Uh, there could be uh, DNA components of the virus that might be blocking the uh, this repression. Oh, sorry. Uh, back to Steve Goff's. Uh, th- mm-hmm. This is important. So, in Steve Goff's work, what they were looking for, uh, which is they're really interested in this repression, and they were screening. It's known that if you don't. Um, uh, if you don't integrate the virus, it forms these two LTR circles, which are still able to express low levels of RNA mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. those circles. Uh, and it's been known, they, they showed that if you use HDAC inhibitors, uh, in those cases, uh, that the virus will express again. And it's known that it's, uh, and that was shown a, while, a long time ago also, uh, and that was dependent on CYTDB1. And so they did a screen uh, for factors that are regulating expression from an unintegrated provirus, and this was what we were talking about, that they identified that the hush complex was actually regulating expression from an unintegrated provirus. So even before the cDNA is integrated into the genome, it gets loaded somehow with mm-hmm. this complex. Right. And the right. really interesting uh, factor that they found was this zinc finger NP220 or ZNF6. 37 or something, or I forgot, uh, is actually recognizing specific sequences in the virus. So in, in that case, the re- sequence recognition, I think, is CCCT, or it's a C-rich uh, stretch, a six or seven stretch. And that itself, that is what's recru- it's recognizing a specific sequence and then recruiting the hush complex to silence and repress this unintegrated provirus. So back to the question originally, how do you think it's working? Well, now we think maybe that the complex is recognizing the virus before it's integrated uh, and then changing the expression, uh, modulating the expression of the virus afterward. Okay. In their case, they did not see the maintenance of the hush complex association with the provirus mm. after integration. However, in some of our cases, we actually do see that. Uh, that's all. All that is to say that there might be actually specific sequences that HIV one has lost that might be targeted by uh, the hush complex through uh, yeah. adapt, yeah. adapter zinc fingers or, or, or something like that. Yeah, uh, his paper is coming out in weeks, so we'll have him on and continue this story. 
That'd so be great. You mentioned 40 different species of uh, primates, non-human primates in Africa harbor their own SIVs. And if you line them up and ask why those viruses were permitted to replicate, how many of them would have common mechanisms or how many different mechanisms would you expect to find in 40 different species of primates? Uh, at least as many mechanisms as I had so described. So is that how many factors there really are involved in, in suppressing virus infections in cells? Hard to, I mean, uh, hard to know, Dixon. No, but I mean, I'm just asking hard if that's one of the ways of, of knowing how many factors there are. If so, everyone is well, different. There, there are some. some um, so Paul Lanner, the same lab that discovered the hush, that called it the hush complex, um, um has proteomics they've looked at the effect on the total proteome in cells of vpr and vpx and they actually um have enormous numbers of proteins that are altered in their data sets um, mm. um so there may be all kinds of things going on um whether they're the same kind of direct protein-protein inter interaction and ubiquitination mechanisms uh, remains to be determined. In okay. some cases, they are. Mm -hmm. There may be more global indirect effects. Um, one of the things about HIV um, and its close cousins, um, which, which distinguishes it from many of the other SIVs, is that uh, VPR is quite toxic, or at least it, it causes cell cycle arrest. And experimentally mm. in the, the lab, mm. it appears to be quite toxic. So there are a, there seem to be a, um, unique uh, hurdles or issues that HIV deals with or throws to the host that um, that may be relevant for why it doesn't have the the VPX activity against uh, against Hush. It's still possible there's some – it's not totally clear to us whether the HIV-1 VPR is doing something to hush or not, but it, it's, it's certainly not as clear and simple as it was with the, the SIV VPXs that, that we've looked at. Um, but if you, if you hit a target cell in the lab with a full HIV uh, – virus um, or or a vector that only goes on a single cycle, if you have all of the ORFs intact, say, to make VPR protein, um, you clearly have a huge selective effect in the, the population of cells that have proviruses. And so the primary integration event, HIV, is going into actively expressed genes, by and large, mm -hmm. the majority mm -hmm. of the sites. Um, but as those cells divide and grow, if the virus is expressed, it's going to trash those target cells pretty quick. At least that's that's how it appears. Mm -hmm. And so there may be pressure put on the host population by by the various proviruses um, that select for integrants that are in silenced chromatin, um, and that may be a very important aspect of. The, the kind of clinical problem that we're faced with now with people who are HIV infected and why we can't, why you can't cure people who are infected with HIV because the, the drugs will inhibit the virus from spreading and replicating, but the virus is sitting there latent in, <laughs> um, in chromosomes of multiple cells, maybe a million memory T cells scattered throughout the body, each right. one in a different location by and large. Um, and, uh, clearly the balance of its ability to hide, its ability to reactivate, uh, the mechanisms, the mechanisms it uses for all of these are critical to, to understanding what's actually happening in, in patients. So if you take those latently infected T cells and you add VPX, does it turn on? So, so <laughs> it should. That's what you want to do? That's what we want to do. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think I'm I haven't heard of anyone uh taking patient samples yet and, and demonstrating that, though I'm sure many labs must be yeah. looking at it. Because that's now. that's the shock and kill thing. Right. You, you turn on the yeah. proviruses, add antivirals and get rid of everything, right? Yep. 
Exactly. So so people are looking at histone deacetylase inhibitors, other things, and you could put VPX in. Okay. Yeah. So are we are we going to talk about any of the line one data? Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. I think that's really interesting. Because and yep. I think that that bears on. Um, what would happen if you tried those types of therapies? Yeah. yeah. So tell us yeah. the last thing. Tell us the line experiment. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we, Ted, another postdoc in the lab, Ted and I kind of hypothesized that if BPX is regulating this provirus, maybe it's regulating other endogenous retro elements. And we were really excited. And I tried to do the experiments, uh, not very well. But then the Wasaka paper came out in uh, in Nature in last winter, in 2017. Uh, from the Wasaka lab, and they did a screen for um, uh, silencing of uh, L1 reporters in, in, in cell lines, so regulators of L1 expression uh, line elements. And uh, the top hits, again, in this screen were also basically the hush complex with a few other uh, pathways, mm -hmm. but the hush complex was the biggest hit in regulating expression of line elements. And then when you knock out, when they knocked out the um, Components of the Hush complex, MORC2 or MPP8, they saw derepression and activation of transcription and uh, a protein production from endogenous line elements in uh, ES cells and in their other cell lines that they, they, they tested. And that was really, really exciting. Um, and so we wanted to see uh, kind of like, okay, another uh, correlative evidence that VPX is targeting this pathway if we put VPX into cells that um, ha have some level of expression of line one, do we see an increase of expression of these uh, endogenous retro elements, line one? And we did, in fact, see that. Uh, one surprise was that we used these Entera 2D1 cells, which are uh, uh, kind of was used to be used for an ES cell like cell. It's a cancer cell line. Uh, and that was very clear that when we added BPX as a transgene, or I could do with BLPs also, that you activated transcription and translation of line one or if uh and in cem 174 cells which is like a, a t cell b cell heterocarion that we use in the lab that i used in the, in the same figure uh also has a, a small basal expression of these elements but if you add vpx or you knock down fam 8 the target of vpx activity it derepresses and and you see the really nice um uh protein but by in the westerns so the interesting thing there is that this is a non-LTR retrotransposon, right? Mm -hmm. So Hush yep. is, is silencing it some other way, at some other promoter, not not an LTR, obviously. Yeah. Right? So it might not be promoter specific, and the the mechanism yeah. and the activity, and the rules of this complex are not fully. <laughs> yeah, on. that's cool. So then. If you if you want to treat people with, <laughs> with VPX, you got to be careful that this is not a problem ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turning on L one, right? Right. Yeah, but in primary, these aren't primary cells. And I did try to do this in primary cells, and you don't really turn it on because there are other layers of regulation besides yeah, sure. just high. So in those experiments, like in ES cells, they're very permissive for expression of these elements, so yeah. It, yeah. it boosts them. But in primary, like differentiated, fully differentiated cells, it, we didn't see by protein release levels, but by um, but maybe by RNA, the levels do go up quite a bit. Yeah. You know, as a an innocent bystander here, I'm not so innocent bystander. <laughs> I think about parasites in general. And so toxoplasma pops into my mind right now, because the way it hides is that it just refuses to divide. It's inside of a a cyst inside the brain, a pseudocyst, and any or all other places too. And if it's not, there's no DNA replication. You can't touch it with any drugs because they obviously only infect the metabolism. The viral. What about other latent virus infections with regards to getting them to wake up or like poking a stick down their hole, so to speak? Uh, I think about uh, herpes, for instance. Right. What What is the basis for the latency in herpes? Virus. Oh, yeah. I would love to try to either – because herpes had so many proteins, so it would be really interesting to see if herpes counter – any of the viruses in the in their lytic stage counteract these pathways. But it is known that herpes viruses are also uh, heterochromatinized when they're latent, and a lot of – in some of the cases, it is dependent on CAP1, TRIM28, and SETDB1. Uh, so there could be overlap and contribution of the Hush complex to regulating those. I, I haven't tested those experiments yet, but okay. – um, that would be very exciting to see if this, you know, the LTR experiments from Goff's, Steve Goff's lab, the, the 
that's an episome. The 2LTR is an episome DNA that's not integrated and it's regulated by the Hush complex. And the herpes DNA virus is in the nucleus and as an episome, mm. also regulated by downstream set DB1 also. So it, it uh, very well could be. Mm-hmm. Would, would measles fall into this also? No, the no. long-term measles no. infection? RNA virus. RNA virus. Different mechanism. Okay, totally. All right, we have to uh, wrap this up. Is, oh, come on, let's keep going. <laughs> anything that, uh, one more thing that either of you, Jeremy or Lanya, want to say before we depart the paper? Um, well, I, I would like to, to point out again that, that this was, um, Lanya reads a lot. <laughs> and I think if he hadn't, if he wasn't such an avid reader, and by that I, I don't mean uh, comic books. He's usually reading papers, and he knows the literature really inside out. Um, and uh, he was ready for the challenge when it presented itself. And I, I, I think it's the fact that he found this and was able to go go through this path and make this really interesting discovery uh, was this fortuitous discovery was because he was ready uh, ready for it when it presented itself. So it's important to read. Louis um, Pasteur was right. Dans, yeah. le, <laughs> dans le champ de l'observation, le hasard ne favorise que les esprits préparés. That is Louis' <laughs> very words. You said you mm-hmm. you knew he said it because you yeah. met him, right? No, no, I didn't meet him. Oh, well, yeah. I, I said that jokingly. You said that at Cold Spring Harbor. At, I, I, uh, right? I did, but I bet you I'm the only one listening, perhaps, that has visited his crypt at the Pasteur Institute. And I was inspired okay. by that. You can no, have that one. It was you- a long time ago, and it was just, <laughs> he was in an onyx casket inside of a beautiful crypt with lots of uh, mosaics depicting his discoveries. It's it's highly recommended for anybody to go do that. It's amazing. All right. The, I also just want to point out that we mm-hmm. there there are so many big questions remaining. So we don't know how it, how the complex is recruited to to HIV uh, sequences. Um, and we, there's so many questions about how it works. What, <laughs> what machinery is it recruiting that's causing the silencing? Um, which, um, which histone methyltransferases, all, all of these things are, are really wide open. Yeah. Well, um, you can, you may be back another eight times. <laughs> is it fanciful <laughs> to think that because this virus integrates so many places throughout our genome, that it is it capable of picking up other genes and then becoming even more powerful for some other reason. Kathy, what are we going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, know. I, I mean, I'm just thinking out I, loud here. Go ahead, no, Kathy, I, go. I was going to point out that I'm not sure we mentioned the title or the other authors or another paper nearby. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> I mentioned so, the title, but not the other authors. So go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I'll let the people who know how to pronounce their names who know these authors. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah. Well, so so um, I I was in fact about to, to point out that Lanya's paper um, has sort of a, a back-to-back paper uh, that came out totally independently um, from a another proteomic screen. They they actually saw that that Taser or FAM two hundred eight A levels, protein levels were decreased by VPX. And this group is um, the uh, the senior author of this group is Florence Margotin Goguet. Um, and they have a paper that's that came out along uh, in the same journal along with um, with Lanyas. And some some of the experiments are are very similar and there are there are some differences, but it's um, it's uh, also, a really, really beautiful study uh, that they did. All right, great. But Dixon, not not to put you off, but transducing retroviruses—they pick up oncogenes. That started the whole field of understandings how RNA tumor viruses transform. So, but I'm not aware of any evidence that HIV is picking up sequences, right, uh, Jeremy or Lanya? Not that we uh, know of. Not that we know of. Yeah. Maybe a long time ago. But obviously, you know the. Yeah, Transforming the retroviruses say that it's possible. We have done experiments where we have isolated RNA from virions um, mm-hmm. from cells where we have defined um, proviruses. And in some cases, you can see the transcripts of the adjacent genes, um, say fusion transcripts yeah. or read through. Cool. Um, so we can detect that. Um, 
I think in order to see them, uh, you know, we have this whole history of oncogenes and uh, tr uh, viruses taking up these oncogenes. You have to have a very strong selection to yeah. to really see any biology come out of that. Epstein-Barr virus, I thought, had some history well, that is like a, that. That is not a retrovirus. No, I know. I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Okay. I'm aware of it. Had some what? But picking up genes that give it Many advantages. viruses do, yeah. Yeah, yeah for but sure. from, from the host, I As say. Jeremy said, it's hard, and having a transformed yeah. focus in a cell is a great selection to see that, right? And, but what else can you look at? Let's do some picks of the week. Can wrap this episode up. Brianne, what do you have for us? All right. I switched my pick during the episode um, based oh, on some now. of what we've been talking about uh, and the fact that, in fact, this is a book I am assigning reading from the next for next week. Um, there's a book called The Chimp in the River. It's by David Quammen. It's actually a portion of his book Spillover that was taken out and revised that describes the story of how HIV emerged from SIV in non-human primates. Um, and so Quammen describes the whole story and the research behind that zoonotic event uh, quite nicely in this book. Um, I always really enjoy it. My students enjoy it. Um, and so if people are more interested in hearing a little bit more about this after this discussion, Chimp in the River would be my pick to help them learn about it. Yeah, he, he embellishes it nicely. You know, he puts, <laughs> the, you know, he hypothesizes mm -hmm. uh, about the people involved and so forth. Yeah. Yes. David Quammen will be a guest on Tuivo next month. Oh, wow. Stay tuned. Very nice. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I, I have, uh, I'm halfway through this. The original journal of James Cook's first round the world mm. voyage. Mm. Uh, and it's fascinating for me anyway. Mm. So this happened in, for those who don't know, about 1770. Uh, and Cook was actually on a scientific expedition to measure the transit of mercury across the sun uh, for the purpose of uh, getting a better read on how far we are from the sun. But his uh, sort of sub-mandate was to chart as much of uh, the uh, islands and, and coastline as he could as he uh, went around the world. And this is his uh, actual journal. It's um, uh, what I've uh, linked to here is the online version that was put together by uh, uh, what is it Gutenberg the Gutenberg project. Mm -hmm. uh, I have actually I'm, uh, I have an ebook that's the same thing that you can get for free, and as interesting as uh, as the journal itself, it's annotated uh, by a Captain W J L Wharton. A hundred years later, in 1893, <laughs> and he gives a preface that's a, a synopsis of Cook's life and uh, occasional notes uh, on the journal as he uh, goes through it, and that's as interesting as anything else. It's is really slow for me because I read it with my iPhone in one hand, looking up all of these locations, <laughs> which is really fun because on Google Maps you can zoom right into a cove that he's describing, okay, <laughs> oh, cool. and see where he was. Yeah. It's very, it, it's a lot of fun. That's cool. A cove. Dixon, what do you have? Um, I have a National Geographic uh, magazine expose of the secret life of jellyfish. This, the photography alone is worth it, but it's also life histories and the, and the descriptions of what jellyfish really are and they're highly unappreciated, except by leatherback turtles, which almost exclusively feed on them. So, if, you know, you imagine you take away jellyfish. Who cares about jellyfish? Uh, turtles. The species of turtles would disappear. All kinds of other things, too, by the way. So, I just was absolutely stunned by the uh, visuals of this presentation of, of jellyfish so and don't forget yeah it's beautiful if you're having mm -hmm. memory problems and you watch the evening news <laughs> you'll see prevagen prominently displayed there and it's of course derived from jellyfish because they have superb memories some of these are really big <laughs> they are there yeah. some of them are much bigger than people. 440 pounds no, know, no. oh my god yeah, and, and recently discovered too by the way some of them were discovered like in the red sea and they, they discovered, uh, you wouldn't call it a herd of jellyfish, but 
they were completely surrounded by these gigantic things that had never been seen before. So maybe it's a smear of jellyfish. A smear. Of- <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Actually, the the official term is a smack. Get a, a peanut really? butter and jellyfish. It's it's a smack of jellyfish. I remember this smack from somewhere. Is yeah. that a herald? Oh, see, I thought I thought it was a swarm. A heraldry uh, of uh, <laughs> of owls. And watch yeah. out for the box jellyfish. That's all I can say. I would like to know about jellyfish viruses. You know what? I I'm bet look, you they've got them. I'm look, well, of course they do, but I, I wonder if anyone has studied them. Ah. I don't think so. Are there any jellyfish <laughs> cell cultures out there? I don't know, but I'm not going to work on them. I'm I mean, going to work these on things are so planarian virus. They're 90% water for God's <laughs> sakes. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something that came out... Uh, about a month or so ago from and so there's an article in the new york times it's a high resolution map of antarctica it's great and uh so you can go to a site that the new york times article links you to uh where you can get 43 terabyte maps if you're not (laughs) careful um but uh there's some nice 46 megabyte maps and uh these were a collaboration of ohio state and the university of minnesota they use some supercomputing at the University of Illinois, so a nice uh, Big Ten collaboration, <laughs> evidently. Mm-hmm. Right. But um, so these, it's the reference elevation model of Antarctica, wow. first high resolution terrain map, and so you can see th- see things just at really high resolution, and uh, maybe you it, could find a cove, right? To tra- right. Your brother right. worked down there, yes. 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 So, so they have you uh, traced his uh, path? <laughs> <laughs> would be. Probably mostly McMurdo to the South Pole and back. Oh, but, all right. yes. So these were acquired over a period of uh, eight years, and they have to collect them, of course, um, only in the summer between December and March. Mm. So it's a big Neat. effort, and it's a really cool map. Nice. Wow. Wow, the stuff that's getting done. Isn't it cool? I tell you. What would it be like to download 46 terabytes? <laughs> we just we had a map. Wait a minute. The New York Times just gave us a map of every... House in America. Right. Really? Every yeah, house? Every house. That's not the political map we looked at, is that? No, no. it's just a demog- demographic map. Every house? Yeah. Every house. Hmm. Quite amazing. Well, if you went to the panhandle, you'd find some of those missing. They were certainly, they would yeah. be. They would, except one is left on Mexico Beach. One house it was designed to resist that hurricane. Mm-hmm. That's. <laughs> Jeremy, what do you have for us? Um, so I was, uh, we've been working with all these viruses or their uh, genes from viruses that infect all these different non-human primates. And I was kind of curious who all these primates were. <laughs> so we have lists of names of species. And I wrote to Harmit Malik and he suggested a book that's called The Pictorial Guide to the mm. Living Primates. Which is a so I ordered it and it, it's a gorgeous book. It has beautiful pictures of each species. It has discussion about their behavior and shows you their habitat. Mm-hmm. The book was is a little bit outdated though. It's from a uh, number of years ago and it it lists um, I think uh, over two hundred maybe two hundred fifty species. Um, it wow. turns out that there, there is a website that is a little more up-to-date, uh, apparently, and there, that website is called alltheworldsprimates.org. That's one word, all the world's primates. And this website is amazing. Um, they list 504 primate species. Really? You can search by, uh, find oh. whichever species you want, and they, uh, in some cases they have videos showing the species um, and they also have some recordings. Um, I was thinking maybe I would try to play one. This is from the olive monkey. I don't know if you can hear it. Were you able to hear that? Mm-hmm. Faintly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah, if you're interested, the ecology, uh, the phylogeny, the mm. evolution of these animals is amazing. And sadly, um, I think I read somewhere that 60% of them are at serious danger right. uh, of extinction. So 
to view this website and to really work it in detail and go through it, you have to um, become a you have to subscribe to it and give a small. It's a reasonably small donation, but it's a good cause. So hey, maybe maybe I should do that for Microbe TV. You want to search it? Give us a buck. <laughs> Damn right. No, I wouldn't do that. It's worth more than that. No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No, that's cool. They actually wow. fund they fund grants for research, and it's uh, that's yeah. it's pretty interesting. It's interesting too. There is a program ongoing right now, which I would highly recommend. Also, if I had to pick another one for this week, I would have picked it, and it's called Neanderthal, and it's a it's an ongoing series. It's a documentary series. Uh, I think it's part of the Nova series, but I'm not sure. Uh, and it's a series of recreating Neanderthal characteristics and lifestyles from all the genetics that's known about it. And then they, of course, have to end up saying, why did they disappear? Mm. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's a six-part series. I just saw the first part last night. It was remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. Right. Absolutely remarkable. Lanya, do you want to pick anything? Uh, I didn't have anything planned, but uh, can I just – pick the uh, Florence's paper. Yeah, uh, sure. The VPS. Uh, <laughs> I sure. think they did a really great, <laughs> a great proteomic screen. And, uh, that, that would be my pick to sure. complement the episode. Uh, my pick is researchamerica.org. Oh, yes. I often show some of their polls when I talk, and I always say, has any the audience, has anyone heard of Research America? These are audiences full of scientists, and only f- a few people raise their hands. Mm. So I picked this on immune yesterday, but I also want to pick it today because I want more people to know about it. It's an advocacy or- organization. They work for scientists to promote scientific research, the benefits of medical research, uh, they do a lot of publicity. They go to Capitol Hill and lobby Congress to increase funding. When you see an NIH funding increase, they have played a role in that. Their website has a number of really good polls, and I use a few of those in my talks, like you know, how many Americans have heard of, know the name of a scientist, right? And, you know, 80-some percent can't name a scientist. And the ones that do the right. top one is is Stephen Hawking, which is okay. But, you know, <laughs> there are many other polls that are worth. And you can use the polls in your talk, and I use a few of them to emphasize the need to, to communicate. And the president is Mary Woolley, who gives talks. She yeah. gave a talk at ASM a couple of years ago. And, um she is the source of the quote that I use at the end of my talk, which is, if someone asks you what you do, you say, I work for you, because that's what yeah. we do. We work for the public because we use their tax dollars, and of course, that is guaranteed to keep the conversation going, because if you say, I work on toxoplasma, they say, okay, I'll see you later. Right. That's right. <laughs> but if you say, I work for you, they're going to talk about it. So, researchamerica.org, and- that is TWIV516, Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIV. You probably listen on your phone or tablet using an app. Please subscribe in your app. And if your app allows to favorite podcasts or episodes, please do it. Please hit the star button or whatever it is. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a lot of ways you can do it, including Patreon or even PayPal with a monthly donation. And we thank all of you new Patreon and PayPal uh, supporters who have just joined us recently. We really appreciate it. And, of course, questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. Our guests today have been plentiful. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier <laughs> is at parasiteswithoutborders.com. You only get two. Okay. And thelivingriver.org. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, it's a pleasure. Really, it was a lot of fun. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Brian Barker is at Drew University, and uh, she's on Twitter as Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. My students are going to be sad again with all the experiments I came up with for them. <laughs> someone, po- someone, someone posted a comment on the t- on TWIV website. Said my professor makes us 
listen to these podcasts all the time. Can you put up transcripts, please? <laughs> Makes us listen. It's a sad thing that they think, oh, I'm making us listen. It's too bad. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in a soggy Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Lanya Yorkovetsky is <laughs> at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Thank you, Lanya. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Great work and good luck. Keep working. <laughs> of course you will. Now, uh, how many years have you been there? Uh, this is the beginning of my fourth year here. So are you, are you looking at leaving at some point? I like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. If I ha if I have to, yeah. I yeah, at some point. Okay. Jeremy Luban, also at UMass Medical School in Worcester. He's on Twitter uh, at Luban Lab, and he's got a, a website for his lab, which I'm very proud of, lubenlab.org. Not all labs do that, but uh, it's there and it's uh, kept up. Thank you, Jeremy. More or less. Well, thank you, <laughs> Vincent. It's um, always fun. I'd like to thank ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>